We are here today to honor Dr. Cynthia Finelli as the David C. Munson, Jr. Collegiate Professor in Engineering. But let me say a few words about our, our former colleague and still our friend, Dave Munson. Dave is currently serving as the president of the Rochester Institute of Technology, and he's the former dean of the College of Engineering, as someone with many talents. In addition to being an outstanding leader, he's an electrical engineer, a highly regarded scientific researcher, a mentor, an Eagle Scout, a multidisciplinary collaborator and educator, and on occasion, a rapper. Um, to that end, I'm not sure how Dave will address us today, but <laughs> we, um, we, we open up on the opportunities for creativity. Dave joined U of M as professor and chair of EECS in 2003, where he led the EECS department in increasing its commitment to undergraduate and graduate programs. He was appointed the Robert J. Vlasic Dean of Engineering in 2006, where he served two five-year terms. Under his leadership, the college increased its annual research expenditures by more than 90%, grew its faculty ranks by 30%, worked with collaborators across the university to develop joint institutes and initiatives, and launched new and expanded opportunities to enhance the overall student experience, including, of course, the Engineering Education Research Initiative. I had the pleasure of speaking with Alec Gallimore, current provost at Duke, for the, the dean that, that followed Dave. And Alec wanted to both say congratulations to Cindy, to say welcoming Dave back to Ann Arbor. And both he and I wanted to express to Dave that um, the college is, runs very well. And, and much of that foundation was set with Dave's leadership over that 10 years. You can always tell when someone's had such a positive impact on a place that they can come back and they see the structures and processes and some of the people that they, that they helped along the way. So I just want to say that, Dave, this is always your home. You've made it such a great place. You're always welcome back here. Dave became RIT's 10th president in 2017, where he is responsible for one of the nation's leading creative and innovative universities that leverages the power of technology, the arts, and design for the greater good. Throughout his career, Dave has advised more than 50 MS and PhD thesis students, served on committees for many others. He's a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Eng Electronic Engineers, IEEE, and he's earned many other awards and honors, including the Benjamin Garver LeMay Medal from the American Society of Engineering Education, the highest award for an engineering administrator in 2016. I had a chance to work with Dave. Not all of his decisions were, made, were that great. He made me the chair of NAMI. <laughs> and, um, and so the fact is, is that as part of that, I had an opportunity around that time to, to start a little center with the Navy. And you know, you always want to have the support of the college leadership when you're going to go talk to folks. And I remember that Dave and myself, and now the chief of staff of the university, John Kinsey, were sitting in the office of the secretary of the Navy, Don Winter. And that led to a lot of great activities we had in that department. We started the Naval Engineering Education Center. And not only was Dave there to help initiate and ideate that, but as I ran that center for five years, it's now part of NAFC's educational structure. Dave was always a supporter. He was always there willing to, to, to come forth and speak to leadership of the Navy, and speak to the congressional delegation when necessary. So it's just an example of how Dave walks the walk as an administrator. It's fitting that the collegiate professorship bearing Dave's name is being presented to another dedicated leader focused on inclusive and holistic experiences for engineering students. Congratulations to the David C. Munson Jr. Collegiate Professor of Engineering, Cindy Finelli. Once more. We'll now hear from Professor Dennis Sylvester, Interim Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, hello, everyone. As Steve mentioned, uh, my name is Dennis Sylvester. I'm the Interim Chair of, of ECE. And uh, I would also like to welcome you all to today's event, uh, uh, honoring and celebrating the remarkable achievements of Cindy Finelli, who is a, a true trailblazer in her field. Um, we have a couple of other individuals talking more about Cindy, so I'll just say a few quick words um, before I introduce the next speaker. Um, Cindy is an alumnus of our department, 
uh, having studied under Janice Jenkins, who you may be interested to know was the first female hired into our department as a faculty member. Um, Cindy joined the department in 2015 and has been mainly teaching our introductory course on electronic circuits, which is growing by leaps and bounds and is our found foundational course for our department. So we love to put our best teachers in that class. Um, but she actually returned to Michigan uh, back in 2003, same year as, as, as Dave Munson joined the university, uh, as the founding director of the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching and Engineering. So sort of the, the engineering um, uh, branch of, of CLR, CRLT. Um, I'm sure we'll be learning much more about that, her, her activities there at that center, and about the relatively newer graduate program in engineering education research, or EER, which we have here at Michigan, thanks to her leadership and, and Dave's vision. Um, <clears throat> so let me say, it is, it is great to see you here, Dave. Uh, Dave was our department chair, obviously, for three years. Uh, I started in 2000, so pretty shortly thereafter, Dave came on, and we had a lot of conversations at that time. I was going through tenure toward the end of his time in the department before he moved to Lurie. So um, I see him as a, as a vital leader in my career that I looked up to. Um, so I know RIT is really lucky to have you leading their institution, Dave. Um, so now I'd like to welcome our next speaker, who is Lisa Latuka, to the podium. Uh, Lisa is a professor of integrative systems and design within the College of Engineering, but her primary appointment is in the uh, School of Education, where she's a professor of higher education there. And she directs the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education. So please welcome Lisa. Thank you, Dennis. Hi, everyone. I am really so pleased to be part of this installation ceremony for Cindy. She's one of the reasons that I find myself here in a school of education, but working closely with so many faculty from the College of Engineering, their students and administrative staff here. Um, it was probably 15 or more years ago when Cindy walked up to me at an engineering education research meeting and introduced herself. And that little introduction uh, became a series of conversations about our scholarship, about the emerging field of engineering education research, um, and eventually to our colleagueship in EER, and to a real friendship. So I'm so happy for that. Um, in many ways, the story of Cindy's engineering life is a story about connecting and supporting people who are interested in improving engineering education. And she did it well before she came back to U of M. She did it at the Kettering Institute, where she brought together her faculty colleagues who were interested in teaching and learning, first informally, and then as its founding director of uh, Kettering Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And when she first came back to the University of Michigan, she did it to help connect and coordinate the work that the College of Engineering was doing with CRLT on main campus. And her success there led to her position as the founding director of CRLT. And as she was doing all of, these, all of this work in local context, Cindy was also playing a strong leadership role nationally as one of the true pioneers of the field of engineering education research. And her leadership across these uh, contexts did not go unnoticed at Michigan. And then Dean Dave Munson challenged Cindy to lead an effort to create a new college level program, the Engineering Education Research Graduate Program, that today has grown to seven faculty across five engineering departments, many of their students, and dozens of affiliate faculty in the College of Engineering and across the university as well. I can recall with a smile and also memories of some indigestion, uh, the work that Cindy and Shanna Daly and I did one summer and fall to hammer out the curricular and policy foundations for the EER doctoral program for approval by Rackham. And no sooner was that program approved that Cindy found herself trying to figure out how to contribute to the hiring of EER scholars who would be appointed in engineering departments in the college. As these foundations were being laid, Cindy was also taking the EER show on the road, so to speak, trying to talk to her colleagues about this new and emerging field that was unfamiliar and to convince folks truly that the program model and the field belonged here in the College of Engineering and at Michigan. In the years since then, Cindy has been the sole director of EER, seeing it through inevitable hiccups as policies and practices were written and revised, mission statements and vision statements written and rewritten, strategic plans created and updated, and new faculty and EER graduate students welcomed. And as she's done in each leadership role in her career, Cindy has moved an idea from imagination to implementation to success. 
it seems to me that the qualities that led Cindy to the top of the EER field nationally and now internationally, intellect and passion, clarity of purpose, unyielding commitment, and their necessary complement, which is the willingness to collaborate and co-construct, distinguish her work here at U of M as well. And it seems to me also that Cindy doesn't see her work as simply occurring in the College of Engineering or in EER. She sees it in a large part as being for the College of Engineering and for the field. So for Cindy, in and for are intimately connected in the vision of a community. And if you look at her record, you will see that pattern here and elsewhere. For Cindy to be truly in community, one must work in service of community. For these and for many other reasons that will be enumerated here today, we're very fortunate that Cindy Finelli resides and abides here, that she knows how to and works enthusiastically to make visions reality. And we're also fortunate that former Dean Dave Munson recognized and corralled Cindy's talents and service and spirits, I'm sorry, in the service of the college and the global EER community. And I feel very honored to welcome him to the podium for his remarks. Thanks very much, Lisa. It's a real privilege uh, to be back on campus and just see so many friends in the audience. Um, in some ways, I was saying this is like the Wizard of Oz where you go off and all these crazy things happen then you come back to Kansas and all these people are still here. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's amazing, but it, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Um, let me talk a little bit about Cindy and, and a little bit about uh, the engineering education uh, program here at the University of Michigan. Uh, the first thing I have to say about Cindy is, man, oh man, is she tenacious. And so early on in my time as dean, um, I started uh, interfacing a lot, in, in, in probably more than I had before, with uh, what was at the time called CRLT North, right? Uh, Center for Research, Learning and Teaching North. And there was this young lady there that wasn't just giving seminars and doing all the regular things, she was conducting honest to goodness, serious research and really hustling to get the grants from the National Science Foundation. And that really got me to start paying attention to engineering education as a possible research field. And uh, I grew up like most of the faculty in the room here uh, doing very technical work. And um, it wasn't that I thought that engineering education wasn't a legitimate field, but, you know, is it really what we're going to do here? And uh, watching what Cindy did, and then, by the way, right away, Lisa Latuka's name was coming up, too, uh, the, the two of them. And uh, I became convinced maybe there was, really was something there, and I started spending time with program officers at NSF, and then uh, attending an ASEE meeting or two. And as, a, as I'll call myself a regular faculty member prior to getting into administration, I'd never been to an ASEE meeting. Uh, and I started attending ASEE meetings and noticing the Michigan contingent and noticing who's at the center of these groups of people where there's this big cluster of people and you kind of pour through that. Who's at the middle? Yeah, people like Cindy. And uh, so at some point, I got pretty passionate myself about engineering education research and uh, wondered about how we might uh, build a program here at Michigan. And the idea I had, which never came to fruition, but let me tell you what the idea was. And then it, it was an intermediate step, if you will, to, to where uh, things have, have uh, turned out to be today. Um, I had an idea that it, in Michigan engineering, we would establish a new department and the new department would essentially be our version of the Olin College of Engineering. So I'm very familiar with Olin, right outside of Boston. Um, years ago, I almost went there to help establish it. And you talk about innovative engineering education, boy, it was really happening there. And Rick Miller, the president of Olin, was a good friend of mine. Um, and so I actually had Rick come and visit. And he spoke to our department chairs. He spoke to the external advisory committee for the dean's external advisory committee about rah, 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 how, how great things were at Olin and how maybe we could do the same thing at Michigan. But Rick did too good of a job. 
the department chairs listened to them and they said, Dave, we're not giving this up. This is really exciting stuff. We don't want this in some separate department. And so I said, okay, we're gonna make a deal. And the deal is this. First of all, we're going to have a program in engineering education research at the University of Michigan. And if you're saying we can't have a separate department that would undertake that and, and offer kind of a general engineering education at the undergrad level, then you have to commit to me that you're willing to consider hiring on the tenure track faculty members into your department whose research will be on engineering education. And uh, everybody put their hand up. Swore and swore in blood, okay, Dave, we're gonna do this. And I said, okay, first hire, Cindy Finelli. And then I think next hire was Shanna Daly. And there have been a number of others since that time. Um, it was around the time I was departing um, uh, the Dean's role here uh, that Cindy and Lisa were really getting going with, uh, with Shanna on the idea for the PhD program, which we wanted all along. But to make a long story short, Absolutely none of this would have happened without Cindy Finelli. Um, universities love to sort of scour the landscape and look at hot topics. AI might be what? We're going to be the best university in the world in AI. You can't do that if you don't already have some of the best people in AI. That's not how it works. You don't just go out and go shopping and buy people. You have to start with something. And uh, what a great starting point Michigan had with Cindy and Lisa and then others who have, have followed in their footsteps. So I've really admired uh, all the work that Lisa has done and I've seen her present so many times. And I'll come back to that word tenacious. Um, most people simply cannot do what Cindy did um, and has done. They can't start in an organization like CRLT and then just turn their career into whatever they think their career ought to be. Uh, but Cindy has done that. And um, when she contacted me and said, hey, Dave, kind of like to name this professorship after you, I said, what? <laughs> I was really awestruck, I have to say that. Um, I never thought there would be a professorship at the University of Michigan that would have my name associated with it. So thank you very much, Cindy, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for your remarks, Steve and Dennis and Lisa and Dave. It's just really great to have everybody here. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Especially thanks to my husband, Mike, and my two kids, Carmine and Kiara. Um, it's you know a humbling time here, and I'm really grateful for this recognition, and I'm privileged to be able to honor Dave in this way. Um, I also have to say I'm quite intimidated with the um, idea of presenting about this, so um, I guess let's just get started. So to give you a, a orientation a little bit, this is my plan for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, to start, I'd like to provide a brief history of engineering education, and then I'll highlight some of the key contributions of my team and I that we've made over the past several years, um, focusing especially on three main areas, uh, promoting active learning instruction in the College of Engineering and more broadly, integrating social responsibility into the engineering curriculum, and building a culture of teaching and learning. And then I'd like to take a few minutes, of course, to acknowledge everybody and, and give thanks to the so many incredible people who have been part of my journey, um, including Dave. It wouldn't be possible to be in this place without the support of so many uh, other people. So to start, um, let me just uh, give you a little overview of some of the many milestones in engineering education over the more than 200 years since West Point was first established in the early 1800s. Uh, after that, more engineering programs were popping up, including at the University of Michigan, the College of Engineering in 1854. And then with the Morrill Land Grant Institution uh, initiative, more and more engineering colleges became uh, apparent. During these early years, engineering tended to focus on hands-on skills and practice. 
At the same time, professional societies like the American Society of Civil Engineers and the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, which later became IEEE, were becoming established. And coupled with the Industrial Revolution, which increased the demand for skilled engineers, institutions then shifted towards a focus on engineering science and theory. Then following the formation of the American Society of Engineering Education and the publications that ensued, um, there were a lot of calls for improved classroom instruction. These were echoed by a lot of national reports, starting with the Mann Report and continuing with many others. More recently, calls like the Innovation with Impact Report and the uh, Engineer of 2020 have echoed those calls. Other efforts also resulted in a broader approach to engineering curricula. For instance, the Educational Research and Methods Division was established in 1971, a branch of the American Society of Engineering Education, to promote educational scholarship. Funding from the National Science Foundation increased to support additional educational research, including several multi-campus engineering education coalitions. And ABET shifted to an outcomes-based accreditation requirement. Collectively, these long-term efforts resulted in improvements in engineering education, a focus on student-centered instruction, and the integration of professional skills like ethics, communication, and teamwork into the curriculum. An important outcome of these milestones in engineering education is the development of engineering education research, EER, as a recognized interdisciplinary and international discipline. Scholars in the space of engineering education research apply theories and methods from education and the social sciences to address issues that are relevant in engineering. This diagram is one uh, way that I like to use pretty often to conceptualize of the continuum of teaching and research activities with EER being the most rigorous form of scholarship along this spectrum. Engineering education research has continued to emerge since the early 2000s when the Journal of Engineering repositioned to become an archival publication outlet for EER and it published a special issue arguing for stronger theoretically and empirically driven research in the field. The first formal graduate program in engineering education was established at Purdue University in 2005, and others soon followed suit, including Virginia Tech, Utah State, Clemson, and Arizona State. During the same, same time frame, we were also making efforts to explore the space in engineering education research. We founded the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching and Engineering, which focused both on teaching excellence and educational research, and we launched an EER certificate program for engineering doctoral students. Then, thanks to the effort of Dave, we established tenure-line faculty members in 2015, and we recruited our first EER graduate student in 2018. We've had two students who graduated from that program last year. In the years after we launched our EER program at Michigan, several other PhD programs have started, including three in 2018 and others each year after that. Several other institutions have PhD programs in the works. So it might seem odd that I'm starting with the history of engineering education, but that's because my unusual career trajectory has really been anchored in that history dating back to 1983 when I graduated from Bridgeport High School, just 70 miles north of here. I only applied to one college, the University of Michigan, and as a first-generation student, I was admitted to the university, and I earned three electrical engineering degrees here over the next 10 years. Then I joined Kettering University as an assistant professor in electrical engineering, and I taught just about every EE course in the curriculum there. I also became more involved with faculty development, and I established the Center for Excellence on Teaching and Learning there. And at the same time, I started to shift my research from traditional electrical engineering studies to more theory-based education research. 
And after being recruited by Michigan, I left Kettering to rejoin the University of Michigan in 2004 to establish and direct the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching and Engineering. 10 years later, I was hired in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department, EECS, um, to do, uh, as you heard, research in engineering education as a tenure track faculty member there. Now I sit side by side with my EECS colleagues. I teach courses like signals and systems and uh, circuits, as you've heard. Uh, I recruit students from both electrical and computer engineering and the engineering education research program. And I compete for federal funding for my research from National Science Foundation. Uh, at about the same time frame, um, I worked with several others in the college to develop an EER graduate program. And since 2015, I've been the director and graduate chair of that program. Throughout my career, my research has really focused on faculty teaching, student learning, and the relationship between those two things. I investigate issues like promoting the adoption of active learning, integrating social responsibility in the engineering curriculum, supporting the success for students and faculty who have neurodiversities like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and instilling a culture of teaching and learning. I often go back to this same image to reflect on my career and the ways I've not only conducted research about teaching and learning, but I've also applied my research to practice. And I've supported individuals at both ends of this spectrum through faculty development. So let me tell you about some specific research areas in which I've worked, starting with active learning instruction. In this space, my research involves a lot of collaborators, both faculty colleagues and students, who I highlight here. There's so much research about the positive benefits of active learning. A recent meta-analysis of almost 650 peer-reviewed papers clearly demonstrates that active learning can reduce failure rates and improve teaching, uh, improve learning. The failure rate for courses that used active learning in the meta-analysis, in the blue bar is significantly and consistently almost 15% lower than those for lecture courses in the, the red bar. And there's a clear shift in the distribution of student scores on concept tests, again, indicating, indicating greater learning gains for students in the active learning courses. Another meta-analysis demonstrates that active learning can narrow the achievement gap for underrepresented minority and low-income students. Comparing classes that used lecture, in this case in yellow, to those that used uh, active learning in purple, you see that using active learning resulted in a smaller gap in exam scores, and it reduced the gap in the passing rate as well. There's a clear consensus that active learning can work for all students in all disciplines. This figure compiles data from hundreds of studies showing that in the studies that focused on engineering students, there was about a 50% increase in learning gains and a 9% decrease in failure rates. And these findings are fairly consistent across all disciplines. In an essay responding to active learning research, Carl Wyman, a respected Nobel laureate, noted that individuals who use uh, lectures as their traditional format are basically providing an inferior education to their students. But in spite of the overwhelming research evidence about the benefits of active learning, lecturing is still the basic type of teaching at many institutions. One study about the adoption of active learning and engineering found that 35% of instructors tried at least three strategies but then quit using them and only 26% use multiple strategies for active learning. My research intends to address that gap. And in our work to promote active learning, we started by identifying factors that might be motivators for faculty to adopt active learning. These include things like offering a local context for the research, providing personalized support to help faculty learn about and adopt active learning, emphasizing how active learning can benefit the student, providing a safe environment for faculty to learn and practice about active learning, and offering opportunities for networking and community building. 
At the same time, we also identified barriers that might inhibit student faculty from adopting active learning. For instance, the research-based structure and teaching evaluations often de-emphasize the time spent towards uh, improving teaching, and they disincentivize those as well. And the existing research evidence about active learning can be inaccessible to a lot of faculty. At the same time, the, the time that it takes both to plan for active learning and to implement it in the class can be a barrier to using active learning, as can the physical classroom limitations imposed by many teaching spaces, instructors' lack of confidence in using active learning, and the perceptions of student resistance. In our group, we've been working to promote active learning by emphasizing these motivators and de-emphasizing and overcoming some of the barriers. For instance, we've designed flexible teaching spaces to address the barrier of physical classroom limitations. We've studied ways to reduce student resistance to active learning, and we've created faculty learning, faculty learning communities to incentivize faculty change. One program we established while I was director at the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching and Engineering is the Teaching Circle for Active Learning and Large Engineering Courses. We used research about faculty motivation, active learning, and professional development, coupled with local data that we had collected at the University of Michigan to create the teaching circle, which would support engineering instructors as they adopted active learning. In the four years we ran the program, 41 engineering faculty participated. There was a significant increase in their enthusiasm, clarity, and interaction throughout the term after they participated in the teaching circle. And these uh, items all decreased for faculty in a control group. We also found that participants made changes in their teaching to increase the amount of student engagement and active learning over the term. In addition, the faculty participants valued the program. One of the participants noted that the possibility of changing their classroom into one that incorporates active learning was a key takeaway of the program, further noting that it helped them see how to avoid risky investments and take corrective action in a timely manner. Another participant commented that the program was empowering to them. The teaching circle had a positive impact on the culture of teaching and learning at Michigan. A second area of research that I want to tell you a little bit about it relates to integrating social responsibility in the engineering curriculum. Again, with the uh, collaborative uh, help of many faculty and colleagues. In our early work in this space, we focused on cheating and unethical behavior in college. Our findings were similar to those of a recent study, which in surveying undergraduate students, reported that 32% of those students admitted to cheating on an exam. 25% of them said they used unauthorized resources. 28% said they worked together when the instructor prohibited it. And 15% admitted to plagiarism. During those early studies, we heard a range of student comments about why they might engage in such behavior. Many like this one, made us step back and think more broadly. This student said that cheating is basically the only way to put yourself on an even playing field. Cheating and ethics are clearly issues in the undergraduate curriculum, and we we're convinced that the solution requires more than just ethics instruction. In a recent project with some collaborators, we surveyed working engineers about the formal instruction they received as undergraduates. We found that only 32% had received instruction in recognizing so their ethical responsibilities. 29% had learned about the societal consequences of their work. And only 19% said they were taught to be mindful of the responsibilities they had to the public. This quote from Dr. Kadir at Berkeley uh, underscores this thinking a little bit more. He argues that engineers have played a key role in creating the structures that lead to discrimination in society. There are external motivators for moving beyond ethics instruction too. Organizations that accredit our curricula, like ABET, underscore the need for engineers to understand the impact of their work in societal contexts. 
and licensing agencies like the National Society of Professional Engineers stress the need for both ethics and social responsibility. There's clearly an argument for integrating both social and technical issues in engineering, but not everybody's in agreement with that. We presented a series of items to working engineers, a subset of which I show here, and asked if those items are part of an engineer's professional responsibilities. Respondents only somewhat agreed that making society more equitable and understanding the social consequences of their work are part of an engineer's responsibilities. But they agreed that advancing basic engineering and technical knowledge was. In a different part of the survey, <clears throat> Respondents somewhat agreed that technical skills are always more valuable in engineering than social skills. That following, uh, that issues like inequality should be separate from engineering work. And that if engineers follow scientific principles, they'll always end up with objective solutions. We need to better instill in our students a sense of social responsibility. As one way to do that, to integrate social responsibility into the circuits curriculum, we're designing a series of one-hour modules for the introduction to circuits course. These modules both reinforce the technical content of the course and emphasize different social issues. We're aiming to establish the relevance of the modules to students' lives through connections, for instance, with mainstream movies like Black Panther and topics in the current news like EV batteries. Our goal is to make it easy for instructors to use these modules. So to do that, we're preparing detailed teaching guides that include lesson plans, slides with talking points, and questions for homework and exam problems. Our first module for circuits connects with the technical course content of capacitors, a very basic intro to circuits topic. And it introduces social issues that are relating to mining conflict minerals in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We applied backward course design principles to identify learning objectives related to both the technical and the social uh, material in the course. And we aligned the instructional activities and the course assessments with those objectives. We piloted the course module last semester in a circuits class here at Michigan, and we surveyed students at the beginning and the end of the term to assess their perceptions and attitudes. Regarding professional responsibilities, like we found for the working engineers in a previous study, students identified technical aspects rather than social ones as a more important part of the engineer's professional responsibilities. And they believed that their discipline and the instructor both emphasized technological advances more than social responsibility. Encouragingly, at the end of the semester, there is a significant e increase in students' perceptions about social responsibility. So we're starting to see some impact. But what's even more insightful than the survey data is all the positive student feedback we, we received about the modules. One student, they noted, one student noted that they liked the module because it allowed them to connect the course concept with real world issues. Another said the module was a cool way to see what an electrical engineer can do on a positive note. And a third said the module allowed them to see there's more to engineering than just the technical side. Our next steps involve refining the module developing more of them, and disseminating the modules to circuit instructors broadly, both at Michigan and across the country. As a third area of research, I want to tell you about our work to instill a culture of teaching and learning and engineering by focusing on two initiatives that I've been engaged, uh, including the Center for Research on Learning and Engineering and our Engineering Education Research Program. In 2004, we established the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching and Engineering, which is a partnership between the College of Engineering and the main CRLT on Central Campus. The center had a two-part mission to support instructors on both ends of the spectrum, both by providing high-quality programming and activities for instructors at the practice end, and by conducting and supporting education research. The professional staff who had been hired at CRLT Engine all had 
technical engineering PhD degrees, and they all had teaching experience in engineering as well, so they sort of speak the language of the engineer. And we appealed to the data-driven mindset of our engineering audience by ensuring that our work was uh, research-based and driven by the evidence. I'm proud of all that we accomplished in the first 10 years while I was director at CRLT Engine, and some of that accomplishment is captured in statistics we put together for our 10-year anniversary. In the first 10 years, of the nearly 500 engineering faculty in the college, 74% had interacted with CRLT Engine in our first 10 years. Over 25,000 students provided feedback about teaching to more than 800 engineering instructors through our midterm student feedback service. And nearly 10,000 participants attended our workshops and seminars. And CRLT Engine Research had published uh, over 125 refereed publications and were awarded 11 grants from the National Science Foundation. CRLT Engine has continued to thrive under the leadership of Tertia Pindergrover, who's here, and it's accomplished so much more in terms of impressive outcomes. They routinely engage about 70% of all engineering instructors through workshops, learning communities, and more. And they've launched new initiatives focusing on excellence in education, such as the Engineering Education Innovation Days and the Foundational Course Initiative. They've also expanded their initiative to include a major focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion with support from the National Science Foundation to offer and, and to develop a teaching engineering equity center and inclusive STEM teaching project as well. They've also offered equity-centered engineering teaching circles and programs focused on digital accessibility. CRLT Engine continues to have a lasting impact in the college as well. And now let me tell you a little bit more about our unique Michigan model for EER that's being emulated by others across the country. As you heard, about eight years ago, Dave uh, engaged the community in creating five tenure lines for faculty to be embedded within the traditional engineering departments, but to do EER as their main form of scholarship. We worked together to develop a college-wide interdisciplinary graduate program, which leveraged the expertise from across the university, from the School of Education, the College of Engineering, Psychology, Social Work. We have so many strengths across the college. Today, we comprise eight faculty who advise students in our home departments, as well as in the Engineering Education Research Program. And being integrated in the departments this way has allowed us to have research that achieves both immediate impact and establishes the foundation for longer-term advances. And we're having an even bigger impact beyond our university. Other places like Nebraska, Cornell, North Carolina State, and more are building programs based on, they call, on what they call the Michigan model. So finally, that brings me to the good stuff. There's so many people who have contributed along the way to my success through the years. First and foremost, uh, my family and friends. I wanna start out by saying I'm thankful to my parents for instilling in me a true thirst for knowledge and education. Neither of them was able to earn a formal college degree, but all three of their kids, my sister and my brother and I, all earned PhDs. So that's quite a testament to their love and encouragement. I'm also, uh, Thankful to my two amazing children, Carmine, who has a chemical engineering degree from our university in 2018, and my daughter, Kiara, who is wrapping up her degree in LSNA and will be graduating with a major in sustainability in, in May. Um, they've been my constant cheerleaders. They keep me grounded and they've been there to help me achieve a healthy work-life balance by reminding me there's so much more to life than just having success at work. With my husband, we've been having a blast kind of building out our new, our purpose company, trying to um, support sustainability in the design of new furniture. And of course, my husband, Mike, of 35 years. We've been on this journey together. He's always been there for me, pushing me to be, be my best and never doubting me, even when I doubted myself. He's been the most awesome, life partner. He's been by my side through it all, and I couldn't be anywhere without him. 
We all know that in research, students are the key to achieving great things, and that's been so true for me. I've been fortunate to work with lots of graduate students, undergraduate students, and postdoctoral fellows, and I've learned so much from all of them about research methods, mentoring, and life in general. I'm so proud of all we've accomplished together. And I've also been blessed to have had the support of so many collaborators, colleagues, and mentors over the year, including Janice Jenkins, my PhD advisor, who sadly just passed away last month. She inspired me to pursue a career in academia. Susan Montgomery, who was a pioneer in this space and helped pave the way for where we are today. Tershia Pindergrover, who took over at the helm of CRLT Engine and is now leading so many great efforts there. Shanna Daly and Lisa Latuka, who helped create our engineering education research graduate programs. Khalil, Mingyan, and Dennis, who've graciously enabled all of my work in the EECS department for the EER program. Michelle Chapman, Fatima Khan, and Kim Novak, the behind the scenes support who actually make our EER program run. And people like Fred Terry, Joanna Millenchuk, Jamie Phillips, Noel Perkins, and Jeff Fessler, who have been eager to learn about EER and have co-advised graduate students with me as they're pursuing EER projects. And there have been so many more. Thank you to everyone. And lastly, let me reflect on Dave Munson. You've heard me say that he's responsible for creating the EER program at Michigan. And really, he's one of the most important reasons I'm here. He's been a true inspiration who left a lasting impact both on U of M and on me. As you heard, 20 years ago, Dave joined the University of Michigan just three months after I did. And as a new faculty member, he attended the orientation program I facilitated in his first year. And even after he became de dean, he continued to participate in our seminars through CRLT Engine. He attended the ASE annual conferences, and he occasionally joined our EER community for social events. Through all of those interactions, he pushed for a culture of teaching and learning at the College of Engineering. He took time to learn about and recognize the value of EER, and he was always a champion of me and my work. Naming this professorship after Dave Munson will be a reminder of his influence and support. I hope that I can honor that legacy. Thanks, Dave. <laughs>